series called You Are. Um, and so I'll turn things over to our very cool uh, senior pastor, Jeff. Really, really good to see you. For those who are in the room here at Legacy right now, as well as everybody online, really, really glad that you're here. This is a big weekend around here because, or a big week, big kind of time frame. Uh, we, uh, last week, um, ended uh, VBX, uh, which was an awesome experience for everybody involved, all those kids. Uh, this past week, our students were at camp in Glorieta, New Mexico, had an amazing time. God did a lot of cool things. Right now, as I'm talking, um, is the F Conference for women in our church. And so they're doing that uh, as I speak and, and will be uh, tomorrow as well. So please be praying for God to speak and uh, for the ladies of our church to be just encouraged and, you know, all that. And, and for those who are, for those of you who are guys, um, we just mentioned it here at Legacy, but, um, and I assume whoever, wherever you are, uh, your host did that too. Um, but the uh, hangouts um, are a great opportunity just to go hang out with some guys. There's all kinds of them all the way through July. So let me encourage you, if you're a guy and just want to connect, want to take a next step, that's an easy next step to take. And I know you'll really um, enjoy that. So today we do finish a series, You Are, this four-week series we've been in, where we've been looking I have four things that God calls you and me, not just labels, these are realities. Uh, four things Jesus, Jesus followers are called. And if you're not a Jesus follower, this is kind of part of the deal if you cross the line of faith and made that decision. But, uh, and they're all surprising ones. Uh, so the first week we talked about saint. If you remember, we put saint in front of your first name. Um, then the next week we did priest. We put reverend in front of your last name. Um, friend was last week. This week is probably the weirdest, the strangest. You've probably never been called this before. And that is vessel um, or a jar of clay. You've probably been called a lot of things in life, some good, some not so good. But jar of clay probably is not one that's been that common. But it's, it's actually really, really important to understand uh, because what we're talking about when the Bible calls us a vessel or a clay pot or, or a, a jar of clay, yeah, we're, what we're really talking about is what God uses to store and pour out his treasure in, the, in this world. How God wants to pour out his love and power and mercy and grace on this world and who he uses to do that. And that happens to be you, if you want that. I mean, there is one thing that you and I have to bring to the table. There is one thing that God looks for, and we're going to talk about that one thing, because if it's not there, then God's not going to use you in any significant way. But if it is there, it will. And it's probably not what you think it is, because God hires differently than you and I do. And probably a lot of us have hired people, right? And when you hire people, you obviously look for the most qualified person you can get, the most experienced person you can get. You're trying to find the best person possible, the best of the best, you're right? Because we want to get hiring right, and that's really important. We've probably been on the other side of that too, where we have trying to get a job, and you go through the interview process, and that's always so stressful, going through that, and wanting to put your best foot forward, and, and especially when questions like, what is your greatest weakness come up? In fact, just turn to somebody and shoot. No, don't. You have to do that. Um, but, you know, that's a tough question, right? Because you, you want to have something to say, but at other time, you don't really want to make yourself sound like a loser either. Man, you don't want to hire me, you know, right? So, so how do you answer that? And it's always, and, I, and, I, and I've been on both sides of that, but, but it, it's interesting. I mean, I've heard all, all kinds of ways people have tried to sort of turn their weakness into a strength, like really share strength as if it's a weakness. For example, people might say, oh, yeah, well, one of my weaknesses, you know what? I just, I work too hard. I do, it's a weakness. I mean, if you, if you hire me, I'm just gonna, 
I'm just going to work too much. I mean, I'm going to take on too much responsibility. I don't know how to say no. I'm just going to be overly engaged. And uh, work-life balance is going to be an issue because, man, once I get started, nobody's stopping me. You know, right? Or, or, sometime, or maybe somebody will say, uh, oh, yeah, here, here's one of my weaknesses. I, I can be a little intimidating to people because I'm so good at what I do. <laughs> and I'm so good at what I do that sometimes it's just, you know, it's intimidating to everybody else, you know? And like, okay. Or, uh, or, you know, I mean, I don't know. You can make up your own. Um, you know, maybe, well, I'll just go quit. But, and I don't recommend those kind of things, like, you know, I, I'm just so committed, or I'm so goal-oriented, or, you know, I get impatient if there's not results, because I'm all about results, and I bring results. It's better to actually have a real thing to say, but there's, there's always this pressure to hide our weaknesses, to make ourselves look as good as we can, right, in that kind of scenario. But here's the good news with God and the kind of people he uses to really make a difference in our world is he chooses very differently than we do and weakness to him is kind of attractive because God, as we're gonna see, chooses to use the ordinary, even the subordinary to do the extraordinary and some of you feel like you're not qualified, you're disqualified or whatever and I want you to think again but there is one thing that is essential, one thing that you and I have to have, we're gonna see that and if you don't have it, not gonna happen, but it's completely in your control. You can choose this. And we're gonna see that one thing, and we're gonna see the kind of people God chooses. As, as the Bible is gonna call us a vessel or a jar of clay. And in the passage that that happens is in the book of 2 Corinthians, if you're following along with me in your Bible app or Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter four. And to understand the passage and why Paul's talking about this, you kind of have to understand the context of what's going on in 2 Corinthians. Um, so Paul, you know, was an apostle. He started a lot of churches, including the church in Corinth. So he writes to them, you know, he starts a church, stays with them a while, and then leaves to start other churches. And he, he writes 1 Corinthians and then 2 Corinthians. But what had happened since he started the church is that other leaders, this was a big wealthy city, it had become a big church, other pastors, leaders came into the church that were very high profile, very gifted, very impressive, and they started uh, looking down their nose and, and kind of tearing Paul down as if he wasn't that big a deal. And, and a lot of times I think we think, um, when you think in the New Testament, because Paul's such a central figure, that he had no detractors, that everybody just thought he was awesome. Everybody you know, wanted to get a selfie and put it on Instagram with Paul and all that. And, and you know, certainly he was well known, but he had a lot of detractors, including these people. And the church was really divided around these different celebrity pastors. And they, they even called themselves like, or Paul calls them super apostles because they acted like not just apostles, but super apostles in the way that they related. And it's always, it's actually fairly easy to structure a religious system in a way that creates celebrity leaders that everybody's like, oh, you know, wow, that's amazing. And it's not that there's a problem with people who are well known, but, uh, and, and we're gonna talk about this actually in Postscript, which is a podcast that we do uh, after the Friday night service, and then we put it on there that just takes the conversation a little bit deeper. And, uh, and in this Postscript, we're gonna be talking about uh, like that whole thing, it, it's 2,000 years old, still going on today, of celebrity pastors and celebrity leaders and how that can be problematic and, uh, and, when, and just red flags on, on that and, and how to avoid some of that. Uh, we'll also be talking about Roe v. Wade a little bit and, and what happened um, uh, at the end of this week uh, with the Supreme Court um, repealing that um, in postscript. So what they said of Paul, these super apostles, these celebrity leaders that the church was split around, oh, I'm, I'm more into this one, I'm more into this one, I'm more into this one, is they said, you know, Paul is just not very impressive. He's a, we know he's a leader, but in, in his letters, he's really forceful, he's really strong, but when, he's, when you're with him in person, he's kind of a, you know, or, yeah, that's not what it says, but still, it's not impressive is what it says, or, you know, his speaking, it's just not really not that great. You know, I really like, I mean, all these other people are incredible speakers. He's really not that great. They also said, hey, you know what? He, he's not really qualified. Like all the, sign, all the things we're supposed to have an apostle, he, he doesn't have that. Like when Jesus was on the planet, he was not even a Christian. And he didn't believe it. He wasn't a follower. And they tore him down that way. That's a red flag, by the way. Anytime leaders are propping themselves up by criticizing others, uh, that's a bad 
That's a, that's a red flag, right? Um, another thing they said is, man, Paul's life is so hard. You know, he has all these sufferings and imprisonments and all the shipwreck and all this stuff that happened to him. If, if God was really his champion, that he would have a much easier life than, than that, you know? So obviously he's doing something wrong. So all these things they were doing. So Paul, in the middle of that, is gonna give perspective about the kind of people God uses. Because the other thing with the whole celebrity thing is that it kind of creates a scenario that those people are really used by, like God chooses those people who are extraordinary and are amazing. And the rest of us, normal people, not so much, but at least we get to give them money. At least we get to support them. At least we get to pray for them as they're doing their incredible things. And Paul's gonna say, that is not the way God works at all. And in 2 Corinthians 4 is where we see it, verse seven, and here's where we're, labeled with the label we're talking about this week. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So he talks about two things here, treasure and jar of clay, the vessel in which that treasure is stored and poured out. So let's talk about the treasure a little bit because he's been talking about that in 2 Corinthians. So the treasure is all that God wants to give people, all that God wants to give you and me, all that Jesus came to make possible that we've been talking about in this series, the relationship you and I can have, full access to God, how God wants to change our life and turn sinners into saints, how all of God's love and power that he wants to pour out in this broken world, he, he wants, he, he, this is not treasure that he wants to hide, this is not treasure he wants to keep from other people, this is not, treasure he's trying to keep people out of. This is treasure he wants to share with the whole world that he wants to pour out to everybody. And how's he going to do that? How does he choose to do that? Through jars of clay. Meaning the world's greatest treasure, all that God wants for you and me, he chooses not just to store it in jars of clay, that would be strange, but also just as strange that that's what he uses to pour out that treasure. Because jars of clay are very ordinary. It typically, like in, in Jesus' day 2,000 years ago, you know, rich people would use jars of marble and alabaster and things like that. And you would think, okay, if you're going to have a great treasure, you're going to put it in that or gold or something like that. But that's not the way God works. God chooses to store and pour out his treasure through ordinary jars of clay. And jars of clay like this one were very ordinary. I mean, every, everybody had lots of these. Uh, it's the way that they stored things. It's the way, the, you know, their dishes that they ate on, uh, the wash basins they washed, um, all, you know, would be jars of clay. And they were cheap, and they were fragile, and they would break, and it'd be like, eh, you know, let's get another one. Um, like, this clay pot right here is uh, cheap. Christy's, my wife is not going to like this, because she's like, no, we could have used that. But... Um, but if, if this was 2,000 years ago and I did that, people would not be upset. They'd be like, okay, it's no big deal. We'll get another one. It was like a paper bag or a cardboard box or a plastic bag you get at the grocery store. It was just, they didn't have those, but it was kind of the same thing. It was just no big deal. And so what Paul is saying is that, that what God chooses to use is not the fancy china. What God chooses to use is just ordinary clay pots to pour out his treasure, to do his work in this world. Which means people like you and me, who if we're ordinary, right, we get a chance to, to play. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians, um, which, you know, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. So he wrote that earlier, and he told them the same thing, because some of this was going on all the way back then. He said, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Like in the Corinthian church, he's saying, not many of you were big deals. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him you are in Christ Jesus who's become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. What Paul is just saying is, hey, look, he tells the church who's giving him a hard time, hey, you know, you're kind of getting a little proud of yourself. Because if you really think about it, when you were chosen, nobody thought you were that big of a deal. 
Like, because God typically just doesn't choose the extraordinary. He chooses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Now, he'll choose extraordinary people too. And that's why uh, one of my favorite quotes from this passage is from, uh, about this passage is from Queen Elizabeth, who said one time after hearing this passage, she said that, that my favorite letter in the whole Bible is from one of these verses, and it's the letter M, as in Mary, or M as in monkey, because it says not many of you were of noble birth, rather than not any of you. And I think, God, I think Paul was intentional in that, that he's saying, hey, look, God does choose people who are extraordinary at times. He will, and some of you are extraordinary. Some of you are hotshots. Some of you are exceptionally good-looking, like Zoolander. You know, you're, some of you are... Uh, exceptionally smart. Some of you have, are exceptionally wealthy. Some of you have a platform that is exceptional, an influence that's exceptional. And that's okay. That, you don't have to be ashamed of that. That's, that. that's part of your stewardship. God has given you influence. He's given you wealth. He's given you lots of gifts and abilities and, and intellect, whatever it is. So God will, at times, choose people who are extraordinary but generally, that's not the way it works. What he gets a kick out of is choosing the ordinary to do the extraordinary. It's like, I like to play golf. I like to ski. God likes to do that. And he loves doing that. And there's a reason for that. Um, he said it earlier. The reason is to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. That it's not about the container. Oh, look at that container. It's about the treasure. It's about Jesus. Jesus. And what he wants to do is use ordinary people in extraordinary ways so that when people see that, and as collectively as his church or individually, how God uses people who are very ordinary, subordinary, whatever, way above our prey grade to do things that are just amazing. People are like, wow, they're not that, how, how's that happening? How's that person doing? Well, God is obviously at work. Let me just give an illustration, um, and it, that's me. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna ask Aaron to uh, bring out a, a pulpit so we're, this is real church here. So, um, and this pulpit is, is one that's really special to me because it's in my, it sits in my office. And, uh, and the reason it is special, the reason it sits there is this was my granddad's pulpit. Um, so my granddad was a pastor, Nazarene pastor in Georgetown, Kentucky, outside of Lexington. And in his era as a Nazarene pastor, that meant he was a preacher. Like I give, I, I preach, but he would say I talk. He preached, like he was, he was really funny, but he was really fiery. I mean, he brought it, you know, your hair was, you know, at the end of the sermon. And, uh, and it's cool, this, this, they, the, they gave our family the pulpit, which was really nice. And, uh, and one of the cool things about this is right, he would often put his hands right here when he wasn't, you know, real animated. And you can see the, where the varnish is worn off where he would, you know, hold that for decades, you know, so it's really cool. Uh, but this pulpit is also the first pulpit from which I gave my first sermon um, in that church. I was 12, I think 12 years old, 13 years old, and I had recently begun to follow Jesus, and I jumped in with both feet, and I started teaching children at church, teaching children uh, that summer in, um, with Child Evangelism Fellowship. This organization does like these backyard Bible clubs. And I discovered that I liked teaching, I liked speaking, and, and that God could use me that way with these kids. And, and so as I was talking to my granddad about that, he said, well, good, because this summer when you come, you're gonna preach a sermon on in, at Sunday night at our church. And I didn't know any better. I just said, okay, why not? I've never done that before, didn't know how to do that. And this is how it went. Um, so um, we you know, this, if you could picture a, a much more traditional kind of church, the pulpit here. And the way it worked is the, uh, they had these big, have you ever been in the churches like where they have these big throne-like chairs where the pastors sit uh, when uh, other people are doing their thing and they sit up there the whole service? It was one of those deals. So my granddad was up on one. I was there, the music guy. And, um, and the music guy started from the pulpit and he was, you know, doing his thing from hymnals. And, and I had a growing problem that is one that, as I was sitting up there, that doesn't get better over time if you don't deal with it, and that is I really had to go to the bathroom. And at first, I thought, well, I'll be okay. I, I could hold it. But as the music went on, I realized um, I'm not gonna be able to hold it. And so, uh, by, so my granddad came up to the pulpit to do the announcements. I snuck off to go find a bathroom backstage. Totally pitch dark black back there. So I was trying to find a door, find anything, you know, find a bathroom. Finally, I did. Thank God I did because I really needed it. 
But when I came out, what I heard from the microphone was my granddad saying, anybody seen Jeff? Um, Jeff, are you there? You know, all that. But he thought I'd bolted. And, um, and I, maybe I should have. But so I, I ran up, you know, ran up to the thing. And the first words of my first sermon were, sorry, I had to go to the bathroom. That was it. That was my opening line. And it didn't get much better from that. I mean, I did the best I could. I was prepared. I, gave, I had 40 minutes to talk. I said everything I knew about God, the Bible, Jesus, missions, world history, gerbils, anything I could think of, right? And, and after 12 minutes, I was done. A lot of you wish I could go back, I know. But after 12 minutes, I was done. It was kind of like Forrest Gump. You know, that's all I have to say about that. You know, and I was, I was done. And, uh, and my, my granddad, I mean, this was not the best sermon in the world. I'll tell you that, you know. It probably wasn't the worst, but it was much closer to the worst than the best, right? I mean, I did the best I could, but I, you know, but for my granddad, it was like the best sermon in the world. In fact, here's my granddad and me at that moment. Um, and, you know, you can kind of see it, right? He, he's, he's proud of his grandson, right? And, and he was proud of his grandson. And for me, that experience of being a very ordinary jar of clay, pouring out God's richest treasures to people in a way that as not so great as it was, God still used it, and I could tell God was using it, was super impactful for me. And really, that's all I've been all these years, right? It's just a jar of clay pouring out treasure, uh, hopefully for the glory of God. I mean, we all do things with mixed motives, right? But it's just an ordinary person with the, with the opportunity to be involved in extraordinary things. And I have zero regret about that. But that opportunity is there for all of us. And one of the dangers of using my story is that I ended up becoming a pastor. I ended up becoming a person who gets paid to do this stuff. And you think, oh, okay, yeah, God's using you, like one of those people that, that were giving Paul all her time. But that's not the takeaway. This is just my context, part of my context, part of my calling. As we talked about in the priest week, we all have a calling. We all have a role. We all have a place. And that God wants to use you and me if we're open, whether we're, some of you are extraordinary, which is awesome, we need you, we're thank, thankful for you. Many of us, ordinary, subordinary. He wants to use all of us, there's a place for all of us on the team. And he's given us gifts and abilities and a context, like this church. And you're not here by accident. You're here because there are things that God wants to do in and through this church, through you in part. For all of us to do our part. And uh, whether it's in kids ministry or student ministry or adult ministry or small groups or serving a community or whatever it is, like there's a role for all of us. But also the context is not only here, but also outside of here where God has placed you, where God has placed me in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our school, in our friendship circle, in our family, that we're there in part because you and I have been given this incredible treasure. And God wants to share that with people so much that he put you where he put you so that he could pour out his love, power, mercy, all that. He could pour it out of you right where he's placed you. You are the best person to reach the people for him that he's placed you around. That's why you're there. And so this summer, let me encourage you with the rest of this summer, let's just be intentional about that. Let's, I mean, one way to start is just the Bible talks about hospitality, showing hospitality to each other. Let's do that in our neighborhoods. There's so many people moving in from, you know, cool people from California. Some of you are that, you know, very fourth, very, very kind of serious people or, well, not serious, but blunt people from New York. Some of you, know, coming here. All these different people from all over the place and all over the world. It's really cool coming into our area. Just be really good neighbors, and start just by loving people and showing hospitality to people. And, and probably for most people, the first invitation ain't going to be to church because they're not ready for that yet. Some people are, but most people aren't. Right? Just invite them to your house. Invite, them, invite your kids to, to their kids to play with your kids. And uh, invite them out for coffee or a beer or whatever. I mean, just 
just engage people and extend invitation and relationship and allow God to work because God is at work in people's lives and he's placed us where he's placed us and just be God's person there. And you may have opportunity to share your story of what God's doing. You may have opportunity to invite to a guy's hangout or invite to church or invite to something. Um, But you don't have to start there. Just start by extending hospitality and allow God to work and he will. Because all of us have a role to play, both in the church, but also everywhere we are, we have a role to play as God wants to use extraordinary or ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Which brings me to the one thing God's looking for. And if you and I don't have that, it's not gonna happen, but you and I can choose this. And this is the one qualification that he looks for. And you know what it is? It's availability. That's all he's looking for. Availability. And you can choose to be available to him. You can choose to say, God, in this church, I'm gonna take a step of availability. God, in my neighborhood, I wanna be available to you. God, in my workplace, I wanna be available to be your person here. And and he will take you up on that, but you and I have to be available. But there are lots of reasons why people often are not available. Most people aren't, even who are Jesus followers. Sometimes it's because we may feel unqualified. And some of you are like, hey, look, I'm I'm not a big deal. I... I don't, you know, know the Bible much. I don't, you know, other people, when they pray, it sounds so pretty. When I pray, people kind of try hard not to laugh, you know, publicly and all that. I just, I'm not, I'm just not, you know, one of these people that God's gonna use in a big way. I'm not qualified. And if you feel unqualified, guess what? God is saying you're perfect for the job because that's what he looks for. That's what we just read. In fact, a while back, I heard an interview, this was a couple years ago, I heard an interview from a, a pastor um, who uh, is well-known. And, and just because you're well-known doesn't mean it's a problem, right? But he's a well-known pastor. And, and he was talking um, in the, on Christian TV or some, some kind of, I forget what it was. But, um, and he was talking about a, an experience that had happened um, just a few months before that, how um, he was getting ready And he had this radio station on, a Christian radio station, and they started talking about him. So at first he's like, oh, that's kind of cool, right? His ego started to inflate a little bit. Wow, they're talking about me. It's this national, you know, thing. And uh, and then he started listening to what they were saying. And they were saying, oh, he's completely unqualified to be in the role he's in. To have the platform he has at his age and at his experience, like he just... He is not ready for that. He's not, he, he's he just, it, you know, it, it's really a shame that that's happening because he is not ready. Now, he has training and all that kind of, but it's just, and that's what he's hearing. He's completely unqualified. And he, he was getting dressed. He literally just like went down on his knees in, the, in his closet. And it was like, God, what am I doing? Like, I don't want to be in the wrong place. But then it was these passages that came to mind, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians that we looked at that God brought to mind just to say, hey, look, (laughs) that's exactly what I'm looking for. I just want you to be available. I just want you to be faithful. But same for you. Some of you may feel disqualified. Maybe you feel like, man, I've made so many mistakes in my life. Jeff, if you knew some of the stuff I've been involved in, you'd be like, hey, I know, you know, God can use a lot of people, but God's, you, you would agree with me, God's never gonna use me. And that's just not true. That's why Paul talks about, and I think it's 2 Timothy, maybe it's 1 Timothy, where he calls himself the chief of sinners to encourage others. He's like, hey, remember, I used to kill Christians. And if God can use me, I promise he can use you. There's nothing, in in fact, God's redemption, the things that have happened to us that we may feel like, oh man, I'm like ruined, or things, mistakes we make, they become part of our story, and in God's redemption, it it becomes part of our ministry. Often the most significant part of our ministry. Other people are just distracted, right? Because life is so busy, and therefore we're not available. We're just busy doing our career, busy doing our family, busy doing our thing, not really thinking about, God, how can you use me in all these places? That's probably the most typical Maybe you're discouraged because you failed in some way. You tried something and it just failed. Like I've, I've shared before how one time I tried to lead worship. One time. And there was a reason. It was just one time I tried to lead worship because, you know, there, there was a holy laughter movement in Canada. Um, 
but it, which I think was weird and not, a, a, you know, not, not very healthy. But this youth gathering became a laughter movement. It just wasn't holy. It was just because I, you know, that was a failure, right? And, uh, and it can be discouraging when things, something doesn't go right. And, oh, man, I just, I'm a flub. I, you know, God's not going to use. And let me encourage you, no, God uses all of it. In fact, that just makes it all the more interesting to him. And we're going to, We're gonna go before God and say, God, I wanna make myself available, but first I wanna give you a warning and it's from the rest of the passage and here's the warning. If you increase availability and begin to serve God's purposes in this world, where you are in this church, wherever God will lead you, let me, here's the warning. It'll be great, but it won't necessarily be easy. In fact, it may be really hard. And because we are in a spiritual war, the Bible says, we have an enemy, Satan, you will attract attention. And because, you know, you and I, as jars of clay, we're not fine china. Because what do you do with fine china? Like, Christine and I have fine china, you know, from, because we were in that era where people still did that. I don't know if people still do it or not. And we have a china cabinet. And we've used that china maybe twice. So it looks, the crystal and china there looks perfect. It looks just like it did when we were given that 30 something years ago when we got married. You would never know it's been used. You know why? Because it's never been used. So it's perfect. It's, but the stuff we use, we've had to rotate through it, right? Over all these years, right? Because it gets gets broken, it gets chipped, it gets chinked, it gets, you know, all kinds of things happen to it. Same way, if you and I step out, God, God uses jars of clay because he wants to use them. Like, and, and therefore, well, listen to what Paul says in the rest of the passage about his own life. He said, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power from God, not from us. Here's the warning. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Meaning God is with them, but it's not easy. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. We're laying down our life so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. The way he describes ministry, here's the ministry brochure if you want to make yourself more available. He says, always being given over to death. I was like, man, that's depressing. And for Paul, his ministry was difficult. And he goes through in the rest of the passage and he recounts some of that difficulty, but then here's what he says. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. God is, Paul is talking about glory for those who are in the game, even though there's gonna be some injuries. There's going to be some disappointments. There's going to be some disillusionment. There's going to be some discouragement. I mean, it's kind of like, a, like the Rams, right? A, a Super Bowl team. You know, they, they get the Lombardi Trophy, right? It is just awesome. And I, but you know who really shares that glory? The players who actually played. Um, not the players who spent all their time on the bench, right? I mean, they were there. They were part, but, but the ones who played are the ones who share the greatest glory, but you know what that season was like for them? Even those who stayed healthy every Monday it was really hard to get out of bed after the Sunday game. They would spend most of that day just trying to recover a little bit. And any NFL player who plays will tell you every player on the team is injured. It's just a matter of degree. You just play through injuries unless you just absolutely can't. And you do that all season and then try to recover in the off season as best you can. But guess what? For all those players and all those Monday mornings and all those stuff they went through, the glory of holding the trophy and being part of that team, like, man. And what Paul is saying, hey, for God wants you and me not on the bench, not in a china cabinet. He wants you and me like right in the thick of it. And at times, it'll be easy and it'll be fun, ministry and serving God. And everybody will understand you and appreciate you and it'll be amazing. And your family, in your neighborhood, in your church, in your workplace, be like, oh man, so. But sometimes it won't be like that. It will be misunderstood, will be slandered, will be maligned, will be canceled, uh, will be, well, all kinds of stuff can happen, trust me. 
And at times it can get a little bit tiring or discouraging. What he's saying is, you know what? Don't lose heart. Because in the end, it is worth it to be on God's team, on the field and what he's doing. And we'll have all eternity. And we'll tell stories. And oh, man, you remember, I mean, here we are at Chase Oaks again. Well, man, do you remember when we were at Chase Oaks? Remember going through that crazy pandemic? Remember what God did for those who were in the game? And let me just encourage you to get in the game. And so we're gonna go to God now in prayer. And my challenge for all of us is to up our availability to him as a jar of clay that God wants to use to pour out the most incredible treasure ever so that others can have a share in it, so that others can understand what it means to know Jesus. And, um, and I don't know where you're coming from as we pray. And I'm just gonna kind of guide us through it, whether you've, wherever you're coming from, I'm gonna kind of talk about different categories of people and you see where you fit. So let's bow our heads together in prayer. And for some of you, you may feel unqualified. You just do, you think, God, I, I'm not a big deal. I, I just don't have much to offer. But ask him to help you hear what he's saying in this passage. That that's exactly who he chooses, ordinary jars of clay. He loves to use the ordinary to do the extraordinary. And just ask God to help you believe that and to then to be courageous to take steps toward availability, toward ministry. Maybe you feel disqualified because of something you've done. And I promise Satan, our enemy, would love to leave you in shame because it keeps you off the field. And to say, God, would you help me get past that and understand grace and understand what you, that you want to turn this into my greatest ministry. Some of you may be distracted. You're just busy doing other stuff. And maybe for you, it's an opportunity to say, God, help me prioritize what you're doing in this world and to be part of it. You may feel discouraged. You may feel exhausted. I mean, a lot of times people come, some of you are new in our church and people come new because they've been disillusioned or discouraged or just worn out and you need some time just to heal. It's kind of like off season for you. And I, and, and pray, ask God for healing and replenishment and at some point, just the green light to say, okay, the season started again, let's go. And for all of us, I'll just say, Father, thank you that you love to do your extraordinary work through ordinary people, even subordinary people. You just get a kick out of it because you're glorified in it. And so, Father, would you help us believe that and live more deeply, make ourselves more and more available increasingly available to all that you're doing in the world. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so normally I kind of disappear after this, but I'm not disappeared and, and at the campuses and online I'm not disappeared. I'm still here because I have something else to share and talk about. And that is, that's why when you came in, you got these little three by five cards. And, uh, and some of you know what this is happening if you've been at our church a long time. But um, every year, in the month of July, I do a study break. And it's the most important time of the year for me because it's when uh, I play in sermon series. It's when leadership stuff and all that is planned this week. This one, I'm also uh, trying to finish a book. And so there's just a lot going on. It is really, really important time. And so um, please, I'm just gonna beg you to pray for that time that I'll be able to hear from God, that uh, I'll be able to accomplish what needs to be accomplished because this one is a big list. And, um, and so please do that. And, um, and then the other thing I do on that break is I, I wanna pray for you. And that's why these cards are there. And uh, so what happens each year is I'll, um, I think in 2020, I was so depleted, I didn't even do it. I told God I can't. It's really good to be at a place where I'm, I feel full. I was like, man, I, of course I can't. I mean, I'm, we're gonna do this. We're gonna pray. We're gonna intercede for people. So, um, if you would, go ahead and pull out your card. Just see it. Uh, there should be a pen somewhere around you, in front of you. And just begin to write out one way that I can pray for you. And I'm gonna share these with our elders our, uh, as well, elders or spiritual leaders. And in James, it says, it just talks about how, for whatever reason, the way God works, that um, there's something unique about the prayers of elders in the church. 
And, uh, and so it's a responsibility that we take really seriously. And so we'd love to know one way we can pray for you. Your campus pastor will be praying for these two, but um, one way that we can pray for you. And the reason one way is, you know, sometimes people put like 10, and it takes a lot of time when you multiply this times a few thousand. So, um, so just like one way. And if you just can't help yourself, you know what? We'll pray for it. If it's 10 or 20 or whatever, but one way. It would be even better, right? Just so we can get through. So what's one thing we can pray for? And we'll pray for it. And what's also we ask you to do is let us know how God answers. Because each year, that's always so cool to see. Uh, there's just some amazing answers to prayer that happens every year. And so, again, I, I know you're still writing it out, but please just write out the one way you can pray. It'll be an honor to do that. Now, we're gonna continue our worship service. And if you wanna, uh, you can... Here in a little bit, stand. We'll go ahead. You can stand now if you want to, or if you're still writing, you can do that. Um, you'll put these in a basket uh, as you leave. And online, um, I think they're, they'll just, I don't know what they're doing. They'll put something underneath me right now to either email it or text it, um, your prayer request, because we want to get your prayer request too. Uh, but this next song is As You Find Me, just really believing that what Jesus says about us is true and how he accepts us as we are. And so let's, uh, let's worship God together. Thank you. 